Good morning, everyone. A warm welcome to all of you. It's good to have you join us for our service. Uh, we are continuing in our series as we look at the book of Revelation, and I do uh, encourage you to read through. Uh, this is our first run through the book. There are so many themes and topics that we cannot cover, but uh, the approach I've chosen is to help you understand how this book speaks to our church rather than thinking of these as events that is so far in the future uh, and not understanding that we are experiencing the last days in our present time, okay? We are facing these very challenges. And what we have seen in scriptures, uh, on one side we have Jesus, uh, his church, and what he stands for, and his saints, and the persecution and the challenges they endure as God's people. On the other side, we see the beast, uh, we see the dragon, and the false prophet, and then there is Babylon, and there are several chapters that deal with Babylon, uh, about this city, its judgment, its falling. And it, it's very important uh, we understand why so much time has been placed on uh, this, this section of the story, simply because the whole idea of Babylon, uh, the system, the city that uh, captures the system of the world, the ways of the world, uh, is something that we deal with and we confront every day of our life, okay, whether in the workplace or at home. And so the question that uh, I ask myself, in fact, uh, it, it comes up uh, in some of my readings and, and, the con and the conversations that I have with some people, is simply this, uh, are we so confident that we can tell apart the bride of Christ and we belong? Okay, now... Of course, uh, this is an interesting question, and to many of us, the answer would be obvious. It's kind of a simple thing. But then, uh, when you consider worldliness, and you consider the whole idea of deception uh, as seen in the book of Revelation, then we do realize it's kind of easy to mistake one for another, okay? Uh, and that's what we've been trying to uh, be clear about in our faith. We want a right definition of hope, of faith, of success, so that we may clearly recognize the ways of the Lamb compared to the ways of the dragon. Okay, so I'm going to read the text for today's uh, sermon. I'm just going to break it down. And I, as I read it, uh, as you read along, uh, do look at the description and try to pick up what the Scriptures is telling us about this city. Okay, so it's the Revelation chapter 18, verses 1 to 20. After this, I saw another angel coming down from heaven. He had great authority, and the earth was illuminated by his splendor. With a mighty voice, he shouted, Fallen, fallen is Babylon the great. She has become a dwelling for demons and a haunt for every impure spirit a haunt for every unclean bird, a haunt for every unclean and detestable animal. For all the nations have drunk the maddening wine of her adulteries. The king of the earth committed adultery with her, and the merchants of the earth grew rich from her excessive luxuries. Then I heard another voice from heaven say, Come out of her, my people, so that you will not share in her sins so that you will not receive any of her plagues. For her sins are piled up to heaven, and God has remembered her crimes. Give back to her as she has given. Pay her back double for what she has done. Pour her a double portion from her own cup. Give her as much torment and grief as the glory and luxury she gave herself. In her heart she boasts, I sit enthroned as queen. I am not a widow, I will never mourn. Therefore, in one day, her plagues will overtake her. Death, mourning, and famine. She will be consumed by fire. For mighty is the Lord God who judges her. When the kings of the earth who committed adultery with her and shared her luxury see the smoke of her burning, they will weep and mourn over her. Terrified at her torment, they will stand far off and cry, Woe, woe to you, great city, you mighty city of Babylon. In one hour your doom has come. 
The merchants of the earth will weep and mourn over her because no one buys their cargoes anymore. Cargoes of gold, silver, precious stones and pearls, fine linen, purple silk and scarlet cloth, every sort of citron wood and articles of every kind made of ivory, costly wood, bronze, iron and marble, cargoes of cinnamon and spice, of incense, myrrh and frankincense, of wine and olive oil, of fine flour and wheat, cattle and sheep, horses and carriages, and human beings sold as slaves. They will say, the fruit you long for is gone from you. All your luxury and splendor has, have vanished, never to be recovered. The merchants who sold these things and gained their wealth from her will stand far off, terrified at her torment. They will weep and mourn and cry out, Woe, woe to you, great city, dressed in fine linen, purple and scarlet, and glittering with gold, precious stones and pearls. In one hour such a great wealth has brought you, uh, has been brought to ruin. Every sea captain and all who travel by ship, the sailors and all who earn their living from the sea will stand far off. When they see the smoke of a burning, they will exclaim, Was there ever a city like this great city? They will throw dust on their heads and with weeping and mourning cry out, Woe, woe to you, great city! Where are all who had ships on the sea, became rich through her wealth? In one hour she had been brought to ruin. Rejoice over her, you heavens. Rejoice, you people of God. Rejoice, apostles and prophets. For God has judged her with the judgment she imposed on you. Okay. So you find, uh, when you talk about the spirit of Babylon, during the time this was written, it was uh, Rome that epitomized the city. And we are familiar with the way the, the Roman emperor and the Romans persecuted the Christians. And they were corrupt people. They indulged uh, in all kinds of things. And they and, uh, lived excessively you know, in the riches. Okay? And every neighboring city and nation would look up to this nation because... Here is where the money, the luxury, the power is. This is the place where you go to become somebody and to make something of yourself. And this evil system that destroys many people's life, that tramples on the poor, that persecutes the people of God, God judges and destroys. Okay. And earlier I said about how uh, do we understand that we are able to discern what belongs to God and what belongs to the world. And in that conversations, uh, there are a few questions that I often ask myself. Okay? These are simple questions like the song we sung just now. But they are important questions simply because sometimes we can give lip service to these questions and simply give answers to them without paying much attention as how we are answering these questions. Okay, and you know, for example, the first question, am I following Christ? If you ask me that question a good, okay, 30 over years ago, 40 years ago, uh, right? I will tell you the answer, yes, because I go to church every Sunday. Okay, and that would be a, my definition of following Christ, all right? But over the years, I, you know, God has been speaking to me and and. The challenge is to truly follow him, truly, truly look at him, okay? And in order to understand that, I should ask this question, why am I following him? What are the reasons? You know, how am I invested in this person? Who he is to me? What I know of him? And then, to make it clear, is how am I following him? And so, in dealing with these questions, <coughs> um, you know, other questions arise, you know, do I know him? Do I have fellowship with him? Am I led by him? And I think one of the important things uh, is uh, not to be careless about being led by the Spirit, not to be uh, careless about, you know, how we understand who Christ is, okay? Of course, any of you will be very offended if I misrepresent you, if I say all the wrong things about who you are, 
and describe you in a way that is not true to you, okay? And the same thing about Jesus Christ. It would be so wrong for us to ascribe things that is not true of Him. And it will also be wrong to plead ignorance to say that actually I don't know many things about God and I'm not interested to find out. So in answering, answering these questions, in, in defining and having clarity as to why we are Christians, only then uh, we are clear to distinguish between Babylon and the church. Only when we understand which camp we are and are truly committed to live in that camp, we are able to stand out of Babylon and stand apart from its influences and its ways over our life. Okay? So that's the, the way things go. All right? And you find that uh, throughout history, um, actually one example that stands out was Nazi Germany. Okay? So what's kind of interesting is that when Hitler came up, uh, of course, he didn't like Christianity. You know, the whole idea of the Messiah being Jewish and the whole idea of servanthood never suited him well because he was uh, all about the Aryan race, the perfect race, you know, uh, the Superman, okay? That's what he sees, you know, and, and he would see that the world can progress only when this race propagates itself. So what he said is that he cannot imagine or see Jesus as a Jewish person. The only Jesus he sees is the one with blue eyes and blonde hair, uh, Aryan in race, okay? And the sad thing about the story is that there were very few Christians and pastors that stood against his vision, simply because his might, his power, his vision for uh, Germany that had suffered much after the World War II was so compelling that they would rather sell, sell out, you know, our understanding of Jesus Christ and accept Hitler's description of Christ, okay, and run with him. There were one or few people who stood firm, one being Dietrich Bonhoeffer, and, and he's a person I would encourage you to read about, okay. So that's the case, all right, with us. If we are not clear of where our commitments are, then it's very hard for us to stand firm and to be clear as to what God is doing in our life. So let's look at today's text and, and we will make some comparisons between Babylon and the church. Okay, so let's go back to the initial description found in chapter 17, verses 3 to 5. It says, Then the angel carried me away in the spirit into a wilderness. There I saw a woman sitting on a scarlet beast, that was covered with blasphemous names and had seven heads and ten horns. The woman was dressed in purple and scarlet and was glittering with gold, precious stones and pearls. She held a cup in her hand filled with abominable things and the filth of her adulteries. The name written on her forehead was a mystery. Babylon, the great, the mother of prostitutes and the abominations of the earth. Okay. So when, you, when we looked at this passage, we do realize now this city was something to behold. There is one aspect of it that was very alluring okay, about this person, this woman, the way she's dressed and the uh, extravagance, the jewelry and all that that she had. All right? But there's another part of her that makes us very frightened and, and that was John's reaction. You see that she was seated on the beast. And you can see that all that she, uh, the power that she drew from is satanic in its origins, okay? Uh, she was just indulging in the power of the Satan and the Antichrist, okay? And what's interesting about this description is uh, when you think about the Romans during the time, you know, how would they see Rome, okay? And some people would just see the success and the greatness of the city. Some would know the kind of terrible things that happened, but choose not to dwell on those things. Okay? Some would never see the spiritual uh, shadows that is operating behind the city. Okay? Some would never consider this city and harlot. You know, a system that would sell itself for gains, for power, for glory. 
But then, again, it's the whole question of how we see things. And we do realize that only the spiritually discerned can understand what is happening in this place. It's only the Bible that shows us the true nature of the city. And so the thing is, unless we are rooted in the things of God, it is so easy to get annoyed or caught up with the beauty and the things this city has to offer. The luxury and its opulence is, can just draw us into you know, following it because it offers comfort and power and greatness. And we can just disregard that there is a spiritual reality that is so dark and evil driving the city. Okay. So in comparison, let's see how the church is depicted in the book of Revelation. So we jump forward to chapter 19, verse 7 and 8. Okay, and this is the church, uh, you know, rejoicing, uh, right? It says, let us rejoice and be glad and give him glory for the wedding feast of the Lamb has come and his bride has made herself ready. Fine linen, bright and clean, was given her to wear. Okay, and it says, fine linen stands for the righteous acts of God's holy people. Okay, what do you think of the bride of Christ when compared to Babylon? So here was just fine linen, but the meaning of it was the righteous acts of the people of God. And it's so interesting, uh, rather than clothing oneself with luxuries, you know, the church chooses to clothe itself with the righteous acts of doing good works for the glory of God, for the kingdom of God. Okay. So it's kind of amazing how, how different... Uh, they see themselves and they understand themselves, right? Okay. And what's uh, uh, interesting about the, 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 uh, the, the church and Babylon is the connections, which we will explore later, of how they are connected, the church is connected with Christ and how uh, Babylon is connected with uh, Antichrist, Okay. So the next thing that we see here is the extravagance of Babylon. Um, so you find as compared to the ch church, the point is not doing good works. The point is to indulge in every extravagance and excessiveness. And the list that I read just now ends e even with slavery, okay? Human, sales, uh, human beings sold as slaves, okay? And so there is this longing, okay? And she taps on that longing, and that longing is for luxury and splendor. And everyone shared that longing with her and they were drawn to her because they shared a common ideal of success, of goal, of hope, of life. Okay? And therefore, they would all come because together they would be rich. They would achieve their dreams. They would dress up themselves with the most luxurious of items and display it to the world. And you find, again, because of all these longings, the language changes. It's a language of boasting. I sit enthroned as queen. I'm not a widow. I never mourn. Okay? And what she gives herself is most important. That's the, the idea of Babylon. What I get for myself, what I have for myself, how I entertain myself, how I get, you know, treat myself with the best things of life with no regard as to how God sees uh, stewardship and on how the Lord moves us to give and share and care for others rather than to possess and to hold on. And because of this idea of greatness, you know, Babylon was so sure of herself that she will always be the desire of others. And who wouldn't be uh, envy of a person who just gets everything she desires? who lives you know, in such abundance and, and richness and extravagance. And that's Babylon. And I don't have to explain to you uh, how the world has bought into this spirit. Okay, we can see it day after day. And I don't have to tell you how it even knocks on our doors. And how we are often tempted you know, to embrace uh, such a lifestyle without really thinking about what Christ has called us to do. So in contrast, the shape of the church is that of beauty, 
of servanthood, of gentleness and humility. You know, Christ uh, would not boast like Babylon. Okay? And you find that that boasting comes from Satan himself. He was a being so taken up by his power that he would claim himself to be greater than God. But instead, Christ, a being God himself, and, and this is, the, the, in, uh, is this found in Philippians chapter 2, verses 6 to 11. This is the book we studied, the last church camp. And this is an amazing passage which I always go back to and encourage you to read. So here it says, Who being in very nature God, did not consider equality with God something to be used to his own advantage. Rather, he made himself nothing by taking the very nature of a servant, being made in human likeness, and being found in appearance as a man, he humbled himself by becoming obedient to death, even death on a cross. Therefore, God exalted him to the highest place and gave him the name that is above every name, that at the name of Jesus, every knee should bow in heaven, on earth, and under the earth, and every tongue acknowledge that Jesus Christ is Lord to the glory of God the Father. So you see, the understanding of glory is totally different. Jesus stripped himself of the glory, embraced servanthood, and poured out his life as a living sacrifice, you know, an offering towards God for his purpose. And then it was God who exalted him to the most highest name, that every knee shall bow and tongue confess, okay, that he is Lord, okay, and worship him. So two different routes to greatness, to power, all right? And we should ask ourselves, because what's interesting in this whole conversation, uh, it's very easy to like one and despise the other, okay? And there are many Christians who have a lot of problems reading this passage simply because it speaks about giving, dying, And so it's easier to talk the Babylonian language than to speak the language of Jesus Christ. And if we're not careful, you know, deep within our hearts, we can grow to despise this kind of language. And it's kind of sad because we do realize in many uh, churches, um, the, the scripture on denying oneself and taking up the cross is not explored or preach about often. Okay. What gathers people together is how you can become successful, how you can accumulate power, and how God can do all these things to you, rather than how God can change your heart to make it like Jesus Christ. So when you reflect on this, it goes, it goes back to the first question that I raised. Why am I following Jesus? You know, who am I following? What this journey is all about? Is it about Babylon or is it about Christ himself? So when you look at the scriptures, uh, we, we have seen this in Isaiah chapter 2, verses uh, 2 to 5. This is God's prophetic word about his city, okay, the city that he will establish. And let me read this passage. It's taken uh, okay, from verse 2. In the last days, the mountains of the Lord's temple will be established as the highest of the mountains. It will be exalted above the hills, and all nations will stream to it. Many peoples will come and say, Come, let us go up to the mountain of the Lord, to the temple of the God of Jacob. He will teach us his ways so that we may walk in his paths. The law will go out from Zion, and the word of the Lord from Jerusalem. He will judge between the nations and will settle disputes for many peoples. They will beat their swords into plowshares and their spears into pruning hooks. Nations will not take up sword against nation, nor will they train for war anymore. Come, descendants of Jacob, let us walk in the light of the Lord. So what's interesting, you know, there is a comparison of all nations streaming up towards this hill, okay? All right? And why do they go? Uh, unlike Babylon, where they would go to make themselves rich, they would go up to seek knowledge. They want to learn from God, that He will teach us His ways, okay? And so that we may walk in His paths. All right? 
a word from our sponsors. We have prayer meeting and Bible study every Wednesday. You can join us, <laughs> all right? <laughs> so, be mindful, okay? This is important to the people of God, the Word of God, the knowledge of God brings peace and disputes. And you find that the language here is immensely strong. When At that time, you would never live without a weapon. Okay? And even now, we have all the security systems in our homes. And imagine having a nation without uh, your homes without fences or locked doors and without the presence of po uh, police you know, protecting you. And so imagine those people living out there and to, to beat their weapons down into farming equipment is a huge step. It's a total change of life. Okay? But this is the promise of God. Unlike Babylon, which is filled with violence and greed and getting more and taking from people, this city is different because the knowledge of God brings hope. In, fi in fact, in Isaiah chapter 11, verses uh, uh, 8 and 9, it says, uh, The infant will play near the cobra's den. The young child will put his hand in the viper's nest. They will neither harm nor destroy on earth. All my holy mountain, for the earth will be filled with the knowledge of the Lord as the waters cover the sea. Okay. And that's it. The knowledge of God comes and transforms our life. This is the people of God. And so, again, when you ask yourself the question, what distracts you from reading the Bible? Why is it so hard to seek knowledge? Why... Things like developing theology and, and, and under, having a right understanding of God, something that is distant and not embraced easily. Okay. And then to make a comparison, what actually do you like to hear and listen and take on? And how what you like affects you in contrast to how the Word of God can transform your life. Okay. So again, um, in Babylon, when you, they do things, unlike the Christians who seek God's knowledge, much of their work is transactional, trading. Okay? So what's interesting is when uh, Babylon burns, you know, it gives a description of all the people who traded with the city and got rich out of it just crying uh, because of their loss. But the whole thing is transactional. Okay? And if you think about the way we approach God, now is it I give something, God, you should give me something? Is it very transactional? I should feel a certain way. I should have a certain things when I do this for you. Or is it based on a transaction God did for us at the cross where He gives us life and knowledge and hope and we seek those things in prayer through the Word? So again, a very different approach. And you find that the whole uh, transactional thing kind of gets to us. In fact, sometimes the messages are preached. You do this, you pray like this way, and you, you give this way, and you get those things. And it's easy to you know, take on such an approach because when we speak about transactions, we can control things. But when it comes to God, there is no control over Him. He can do what He chooses. We learn to submit, to surrender, and to follow, and to trust in His love and His goodness. So there's totally two different ways again here in the approach of worship. Okay? And again, we shouldn't confuse one with another. Now look at the whole idea of glory. Okay? When you look at Babylon, it's all concentrated to the center the way this woman is dressed, okay, it's all about that person. Okay, it's all about drawing everyone to that person, that greatness. All right? But whereas the glory of God moves throughout the whole earth, that it says, for the earth will be filled with the knowledge and the glory of the Lord as the water covers the sea. And the glory of God, when it moves, when people understand who He is, when hearts receive Him, it restores all creation to its former glory. And in the last time, a greater glory. 
It makes everything beautiful and resonate with the glory of God. It was ma- we are made in His image, and therefore we will again you know, reflect His image in the fullness in Jesus Christ. This is how the glory of God works. You know, as much as it belongs to God, as much as it's focused and centers on God, but it is something that flows and transforms and embraces all things rather than being like Satan who steps on everyone else and raises his hand. And like this city who persecutes, you know, who does all kinds of business deals, you know, hurting people, using people in, for its own sake. And we understand these things. Right? And the glory of God is amazing. And that's the promise to us that we will be glorified in our Lord Jesus Christ. The next thing we want to see is the relationship between Jesus Christ and His church as compared to Babylon and the beast. Now we find this interesting that t- thing that pl- t- takes place at the end. Okay, So as much as God brings about destruction. And, and, and we, we, we studied this in our Wednesday prayer meeting about how judgment takes place, and even here. So, as much as it's God who's judging, but you see that evil empires consume each other. And what's interesting, as much as the woman was seated on the Antichrist, he hated her. Okay. In chapter 17, verse 16, it says, The beast and the ten horns you saw will hate the prostitutes. They will bring her to ruin and leave her naked. They will eat her flesh and burn her with fire. So this is the spirit of the Antichrist. He will use all the systems, but at the end of it, nothing is above him. And all the kings is the same way. They will use these things for their power, for their glory. And when everything has been used, they will discard and throw. Okay? And, and the whole idea of harlot comes into something to be used without any dignity and respect. All right. And compared to the church in Revelation chapter 5, verses 9 and 10, it says, And they sang a new song saying that you are worthy to take the scroll and to open its seals because you were slain and with your blood you purchased for God persons from every tribe and language and people and nations. You have made them to be a kingdom and priests to serve our God and they will reign on the earth. So it's so different. Bride, the language. Fidelity to one person. In fact, the whole, when Paul speaks about marriage, he shows us the relationship between Christ and the church as an, as an example of what marriage should be like. Okay? In Ephesians chapter 5, verse 25 to 27, it says, Husbands, love your wives just as Christ loved the church and gave himself up for her to make her holy, cleansing her by the washing with water through the word and to present her to himself as a radiant church without stain or wrinkle or any other blemish but holy and blameless. So rather than the beast, you know, all these people enjoying their luxuries and the beast playing his game, and then at the end of it, when he has it all, he destroys the lives of people. And that's Satan. The devil comes to steal, kill, and destroy. No one will have a good life with him. For him, you know, he lives for himself. Okay. But in contrast to our great God, who gave his life so that we may live. And so at the end of it, you know, when judgment comes, Babylon's true face will be seen. You know, how the world lives. Its true state is described here. Fallen, fallen is Babylon the great. She has become a dwelling for demons and a haunt for every impure spirit, a haunt for every unclean bird, a haunt for every unclean and detestable animal. For all the nations have drunk the maddening wine of her adulteries. The kings of the earth committed adultery with her, and the merchants of the earth grew rich with her excessive luxuries. So the true state of this life is revealed at the end. Okay. And uh, judgment will be swift 
uh, the language here, it says in an hour, in an hour, in an hour. And what we see throughout history, every time an empire raised itself, and every time uh, you know, baby, an idea of Babylon was presented, whether it was Rome or, or whether it's Germany or the communism or something like that, you know, a models of, of success or capitalism, you find that God frustrates these powers. You know, they always hit a wall. They always crumble. You can read the news as much as uh, whether America, you know, boasts about the capitalism it embraces, but again, it's not working. And uh, more people hurt, broken, and lo lonely because of all of this. And that's the way God's judgment is. And it will culminate in the end, you know, when evil shows itself in its fullness, God will frustrate this evil by allowing it to consume itself. So when we uh, think about these things, earlier I, I raised a set of questions. You know, here there are questions to compare the two. Who built Babylon? Who builds the church? What did Babylon want? Why did the people ascend the mountain of the Lord? Okay. And what did Babylon clothe herself with? And what did the church clothe herself with? What did the beast do to, uh, sorry, to Babylon? And what... Did Christ do for us? Okay. And you can see the stark differences. And God would warn us and say, come out from Babylon. Don't stay in the city. Live apart from her. So church, I do want to encourage you. I mean, let's not take these things for granted. Let us not assume that we are so, uh, so easily can tell the difference between the ways of the world and the ways of God. And Jesus warns us many time, uh, times about the love for the world, storing up treasures in the world. And we have to be careful how this consumes us. And so the, the real question that we should ask ourselves is not how much we are storing and getting, but perhaps the best place to start is how is our relationship with Christ? Do we seek Him? Do we know Him? Do we follow Him? Are we in love with Him? Are we filled with His love? You know, do we live as the bride of our Lord Jesus Christ? Amen. Let's pray. We thank You. We praise You, Father. And while we, we just worship the Lord, we'll sing the song, God, I look to you. Um, but before we do, uh, let, let us come before the Lord and open our hearts to Him and allow the Holy Spirit to convict us and speak to our hearts. May God ask us, you know, if we, we do love Him, are we consumed by His love, shaped by His love? Let us come to the cross and look to the cross and understand what glory means an amazing transformational work of God that shapes us and sets us free as compared to all the luxuries and entertainment that we chase that actually entraps us and leaves us dry and narrow. Jesus stands before us, knocking on our door, asking us to open so that He may have fellowship with us. We praise You, Jesus. We thank You, God. We look to You, Lord, in this moment.